Good evening and welcome to Our World. Tonight we proudly present the second outstanding chapter of the Nine Network production, Inside the Reef. islands scattered along its entire 2,000 kilometre length. Most of them are continental islands, once part of the Australian continent before they were cut off by a rising sea. And then there are coral caves. They don't have the size and grandeur of the continental islands, but the caves have a complexity and a beauty that comes from being born from the ocean rather than the land. A cay is an outcrop of sand and coral, part of a reef that's grown upwards until it breaks clear of the highest tide and turns into a permanent island. The greatest concentration of Australian cays is at the southern end of the barrier reef, in the Capricorn Bunker Group. When it comes to choosing a cay that's typical of them all, you're faced with an impossible choice. Just about the only thing they have in common is that all of them were created by the forces of the wind and the sea from building blocks made by creatures of the reef. Apart from that, they're all different. Even though many of them are close neighbours, within sight of each other, every K is a different world, separated by the depths of the ocean. Two have been developed as resorts. There's Heron Island, built around one of the world's most celebrated diving spots. The reefs of Heron attract a worldwide clientele, and after seeing the size of the Kays and their isolation, it's something of a surprise to find a well-developed resort so far from anything else. On Lady Elliot, a strictly limited number of visitors share the island with an astonishing variety of seabirds. Although human beings have been coming here for 150 years, you have the feeling that Elliot still belongs to the birds. In places, man has been and gone. One of the most picturesque spots in the group is North Reef, a tiny cay where families once tended the lighthouse before the days of automation. Scientists use the cays as research stations to unlock some of the barrier reef's remarkable secrets. There are camping islands and some delightfully deserted and remote examples of Kays, storybook places that have the peace and tranquility you expect from a tiny South Sea island. At present we're crossing a channel between North Reef and Broomfield Reef. In about half an hour we should get some shelter from Broomfield. We're seeing the coral islands with Ron Isbell, skipper of the Tropic Rover. Ron knows the Capricorn bunkers from top to bottom, and after more than 30 years in these waters, his practical knowledge of the reef and the coral caves is unsurpassed. He's a pioneer diver and has seen much of it from below. But like anyone who really knows the reef, he accepts he can never see it all. No, never, never. He could, he could spend a lifetime and every dive is something different, something new. Also with us is Len Zell, a marine biologist who's studied and worked on the reef for 17 years. It's far beyond one individual's ability to go and experience the entire Great Barrier Reef. That's just to visit all the areas, let alone experience the moods of the place. The diversity of materials that make up K is really quite incredible. I mean, you get bits of coral, um, bits of shells, uh, a whole lot of little pieces of algae come in ashore, and that's all ground up making sand. 
But this area here, and this is quite an, an unusual K in some respects, if you look at it, you can see all these very small orange pieces in there. Mm -hmm. They're in fact small single-celled animals called forams, and they make these little limestone skeletons. There's no rock here at all. There's no volcanic origin material at all. It's all totally biologically produced. This entire reef that we're sitting on, this entire K that we're looking at here is totally biologically produced. The source of every tiny grain on the K is in the surrounding water. The teeming life of a coral reef where we see the most successful colony of builders in the history of life on the planet. The waters around the southern Kays are crowded places even by the standards of a coral reef. Their position near the open sea and their distance from the rivers of the mainland have given them clean water with a richness of coral variety and marine life that's as good as any part of the barrier reef. The corals which encrust every possible surface are relentless underwater colonizers who have been building the Great Barrier Reef for millions of years. The caves up above are only the tip of the structure. The corals are living animals. Waving polyps extend from the surface to feed on creatures even smaller than themselves. A few of the extended tentacles sense a threat. A danger signal is flashed through the colony and they all withdraw to safety, very much the response of an animal. When a coral dies, what's left behind is a hard limestone skeleton which is broken down into smaller pieces, some finer than grains of sand. The skeletons that remain become the base for new colonies. Some of the sand is made by fish. They include the parrots, named because their front teeth are fused together like the beak of a bird. They constantly peck at the coral, eating an algae that grows with the polyp. After the parrotfish has finished grazing like a marine goat, the pieces of coral taken in with every mouthful are crushed and expelled as more sand for the ever-growing base of the coral cay. The breakdown of dead coral creates new opportunities for life and some remarkable behaviour. A blue tuskfish is so preoccupied that it ignores our presence. It's busy at work in what looks like nest building. Although some fish do build nests for their eggs almost exactly like this, what the tuskfish is actually doing is foraging for food, carefully turning over the rubble in search of tiny crabs. Until this, I'd never given fish much credit for any sort of behaviour you could interpret as work. But this busy and very specific method of excavation went on without a break. Other fish aren't so fussy. Opportunists who'll eat practically anything on offer. It's easy to attract a miniature feeding frenzy by scraping the flesh of a dead fish. But inevitably, where there are smaller fish, there are bigger ones. And they include that bogeyman of the deep, the shark. Listen, who's been feeding in my wetsuit anyway? <laughs> We're preparing to dive at North Reef, the top end of the Capricorn Bunker Group. It's our second dive in an area where we know there are sharks. How big are the sharks, Ron? Oh, mostly whalers around here, probably seven feet, eight feet. Boat skipper Ron Isbell feels confident enough about the sharks to indulge his rather macabre sense of humour. Hope you fellas made sure your knives are sharp because uh, in extremity you may have to cut your throat. <laughs> it's a joke that's not for the nervous, but Ron is keen to get us back into the water to dispel the general view of sharks as relentless underwater killers. Give us a head no, no, no. Yeah. Good, good. 
Ron is fully aware that even now there are sharks watching. A sixth sense told them we were here. Our splashes as we entered the water and every movement since were picked up by pressure sensitive pores on the skin of the shark. When fish are speared, their dying movements alert the shark that there's easy food nearby. Ron fills the water with particles of dead fish. Our efforts to attract a shark could also be a classic lesson in what not to do if you want to avoid them. The smaller fish become excited in their feeding and finally the activity, the smell and taste of food and scraps lying around for the taking is too much. of at least three sharks, graceful whalers, pick up scraps from the bottom. But still, they can't be attracted any closer. For all their size and power, most sharks are by nature timid and nervous creatures. They're now swimming in patterns researchers believe is aggressive behaviour, but they show no other sign that they might attack. It's only after at least half an hour of skirting around like this that one of the sharks can be enticed in close. Even divers with a long experience of sharks would not be doing this without a shark-proof cage. But what would be terrifying for most people is an ordinary event to Ron Isbell. No, it's, it's a thrill, it's a buzz, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, they're a little bit like dogs, as long as you don't make any sudden movements and, uh, and scare them, they'll, they'll just come in and act very gentle with you. But is there any danger in actually holding a piece of fish out like that? Uh, not with that particular shark, because he wasn't making the, uh, the actions which would indicate that he was going to snap at anything that came along. So you were quite confident at, at all oh, times? Oh yeah, had no, no problems there, none at all. There was one or two down there. What if uh, you encountered a pack? Would that present any Oh, that is different because you can't watch them all at once. It's OK. While well, you, well, you can see two or three sharks and see them coming in, but they will sneak in behind you, and before you know it, there's something uh, wiring at the back end of your wetsuit, you know? In underwater terms, Ron Isbell comes as close as anyone can to seeing it all. He started diving in the days when there was no such thing as equipment for sale. He had to build it all himself. He used a hand compressor to fill his tanks and was one of the pioneers of Australian scuba diving. On any dive, Ron can show you something worth seeing. He's found a moray eel in a typical habitat, a hole or a cave in the coral. Like the shark, the moray eel is another creature of the sea surrounded by contradiction. Some of the country's most respected writers of books on fish give warnings about the moray eel in the strongest of terms. They've been described variously as savage, aggressive, pugnacious creatures that can attack without apparent provocation. Other authorities say they're rare and reluctant biters. Ron is unconcerned but careful about hand feeding fish to a set of fangs that are razor sharp. This one isn't as large as they grow, but it is untamed. A depth and pressure gauge probably looked fairly tasty, but fortunately for Ron, it was a bit tough and probably indigestible. A moray is normally a hunter of the night that swims free from the safety of its lair in search of prey. The feeding behaviour we saw in daylight is out of character but the moray is intelligent enough to override instinct for the attractions of an easy meal. And it's this apparent intelligence that's led to so many contradictions over its true nature. Many experienced divers take a special delight in first befriending them and then taming them. A moray which has made its home off Lady Elliot Island is starting to get used to regular groups of divers turning up with food. Master Godfrey Thomas believes it can be tamed. They, after a while, will get very, very used to being fed. And uh, with the big lump of fish, which I cut a, a fillet off, 
I'd handed him the fillet and he didn't like that. He wanted the whole fish. And I've got very strong hands and I grab, grabbed hold of that fish and do you think I, I could hold it back for him? No way in the world. He is just so strong. It's unbelievable how strong he is. Like many others, Godfrey disputes what's said and written about the mores being vicious. They're a very aggressive looking animal um, because they are always opening and closing the mouth and they've got quite a nice set of fangs, uh, as you've probably noticed. And, uh, but they are actually a fairly peace, peaceful animal and uh, they don't really attack divers. These two eels on the reef at Heron Island have nicknames, Harry and Fang. They're very tame. Dive master Harry Hornstra often hand feeds them, strokes them and even picks them up. Fang's name was given because...